This is John McEwen on the Americana Music Show, and today I've got a very special guest, Richard Conlon, who works with BMI. What do you do at BMI, and what is it, Richard? Well, BMI is an organization that represents songwriters and music publishers, and what we do is make it easy for parties that publicly perform music, parties like radio stations and television networks and bars and restaurants and internet sites, to get the rights to perform musical compositions. By perform, you mean broadcast or use? That's correct. It's really, we are in the use aspect of copyright. So we're not in the part of copyright where you're making a copy of a CD or syncing a song up into a television show. We're all about public performance, which is transmission or the performance of that work in a public venue. Uh, this is an interview that's a lot for people in the music business or beginning, but also for people that are listening that don't know the mysteries of what happens to who makes the money. I was told in 1967 that publishing is a real estate of the music business. That's a great analogy. Basically, what happens for a songwriter and or a music publisher is that they have a recurring revenue stream. And I'll speak specifically to what we do here at BMI. One of those revenue streams is this right of public performance. So if you write a song, whether you record it or whether someone else records it, whenever that song is played, the public performance copyright is triggered. And what we do as a service business is make it easy for the parties who perform that work to get a license. We have six and a half million works in the BMI network. Are they all songs? Some of them are songs, and some of them are cues. Some of them can be background music. BMI, for those that don't know, for those listening, means Broadcast Music International. And what that means, folks, is that when music is broadcast, meaning when it goes out in the air is when you can hear it, it's international. So BMI collects money from people that broadcast music and sends it to the publishing company who splits the money with the writer in however that deal is set up. There's almost as many different types of deals as there are songs. I think what's really kind of interesting about it, with the Broadcast Music Inc. does work internationally where we, we do represent the rights that were granted by our writers and publishers all around the world. And basically, we're, we're sort of the piece in the middle between the person or the business that's broadcasting or performing that music and the person who created it. And what we do is make sure that when that money comes in, that we track the performances. I'll tell you, being... Richard, just so people understand, you said cues. Now, that means music cues. When you're watching a TV show, folks, and there's a bunch of music behind it, it's going to be a company such as BMI or the, I don't know if you call ASCAP a competitor, but I'm looking at a, at a BMI royalty statement right now, and I have a lot of music cues out there. And it is absolutely fascinating to see that the Garden Show in Australia you used a piece of my music, and BMI collected eight cents for 20 seconds use nine months ago. And, you know, things like Jimmy Kimmel used a piece of music last year, and it collects a dollar fifty that gets reported to BMI. And, and it's, it's amazing where these income streams come from. And you guys do that. What is it on a honor basis? Because why do these people that are so far away report? That's a good question. In Australia, for example, we have a relationship with a company who does what we do, a company called APRA. And we have a relationship where they represent BMI Works and take care of BMI Works in Australia and track their use and license them. And then they remit the money back to us so that the writers can be paid. And how about Europe? Same thing. There are more than 100 different international agreements that we have. So we create a really a global network, uh, whether you're in Europe or Asia, Australia, South America, all around the world. All of the societies work together and make sure that when songs are being played, that they're being represented. And most importantly, that when they're being played, that that money is making its way back to the songwriter and to the music publisher. And that's a fascinating thing because just so people know, you're talking about the fee that a TV or radio station pays out every year based upon the size of the station and the reach. Is that correct? That's right. We have different types of fee levels, but basically it all gets back to either revenue or audience size. And then the fees are, the fees are assessed based on, based on one of those factors. That's, that's right. 
Is it public knowledge what NBC would pay for their BMI licensing fee for a year? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Would it be okay to say what it, if I do a song on NBC, say on the Tonight Show, which is prime time, which is considered what six fifty nine to eleven fifty nine? Mm-hmm. What would that song earn? I don't have that number in front of me, but it well, can I, be. I've always heard that currently it's about forty four hundred dollars. That, that sounds that, about right. That sounds about right. So, and I've always. When I try to explain BMI to people, I would go back to the reference the 60s, 70s, and how Johnny Carson and Paul Anka wrote da 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 the Tonight Show theme. And since they wrote it, and it was used at the beginning and the end of the show, and the payment then was like 2200 per use, that every night Carson and Anka were splitting up about $4,400. And a BMI or ask, I don't know if it was BMI or, or how it was paid, but that is a clever thing, isn't it? I think what happens is that writers say, gosh, maybe I won't take as much money up front and I'll, I'll work as you, you used the real estate analogy before, which I think is so, is so right on that uh, the writers say, well, so I'll put my work into, you know, in this case, into a television show. And uh, if the show takes off, then it's, it's a hit and, and, and it, can, it can be lucrative. And if you have, for instance, the theme to a comedy like Welcome Back, Cotter, I would estimate that that made more money for John Sebastian than some of the Love and Spoonful hits. That's very possible, yeah. Because you figure it's a big catalog business. You know, when you think about music, people might think, oh, gosh, it's just about what the hits are. But the whole thought in, in publishing is that it's about catalog and it's about television shows and it's about music that just plays for a very long life cycle all over the world. And it's a business of pennies, but they add up. And what, he, what he's talking about, we're speaking with Richard Conlon at BMI, who's uh, pretty high up the food chain there, aren't you, Richard? I manage our corporate strategy and our digital revenue streams and our communication effort. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be having a lot of fun here. So what you're referring to about the in income streams that build up, I've been told that, for instance, Suicide is Painless, the theme to MASH, could very likely still be earning, even though it's so many years after. Well, when you walk into a, you could walk into a hotel in London, Sydney, Australia, Tokyo, L.A., anywhere, and within a certain amount of hours, you're going to see a rerun of Mesh in any one of those places today. Don't you think that's a likely situation? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's where. Um, Again, it's this whole catalog effect, and, and I think something that we're, we're so lucky about in the U.S. is that we export so much entertainment, so much uh, musical content um, that it, 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 extends the, it extends the life cycle. And it's interesting because when we are um, tracking and, and processing these uses around the world, we have to know, uh, for example, that... Um, the which episodes of which songs are, of which TV shows are being played, mm -hmm. um, and secondly, what they are like. I Love Lucy episode forty-two might be called something very different in Italy than it might be called in Germany, and it might yeah. be. Um, so, and we have to have all of that information in our database to make sure that we're associating episode forty-two with with that play that took place in Italy at such and so time period uh, to make sure that 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 all of all of the interested parties are are, are getting their fair share. Well, in my comment about MASH, I'd heard that it's very likely it could still be earning the writer 30 years later, to about 2000 a week from the collecting of all these worldwide income streams. That's, that's possible. I don't have that one on the tip of my head, but, um, well, but it, is, it is possible to have a long-term annuity um, you know, c coming out of these rights. Uh, how about just getting right to the bone? Uh, a number one hit on country radio that goes to number one and has a 14, say, 12, 14 week life. Can you give me an estimate of what that might have earned uh, in BMI broadcast money? Because there's 2,100 radio stations playing the death out of it. That I don't have that in front of me, John, but I can get that for you from uh, from one of our people. Okay, for movie music, how does BMI represent movie music, Richard? You mentioned movie music earlier. Is it you? wait until it's a broadcast movie or is it that's, that, that, that's a great point we we have a, a a group in los angeles that services the film and the film and movie industry and and all of the writers and um 
television shows, once they hit the air, whether they're on broadcast TV or cable or delivered over broadband, immediately um, start playing. Um, here in the U.S., in terms of feature films, a feature film that plays in a movie theater does not generate royalties um, for the writer. But uh, to I think where you were going, John, is as, as soon as that feature film ends up on HBO or Showtime or on pay-per-view and all of those subsequent places that that film can be, can be played, um, we would be licensing the music in that film. Now, the licenses are fairly general. In other words, they're agreed upon. A, a TV station doesn't have to pay out an exorbitant amount. Isn't it kind of like a, an agreed-upon sync fee? that you're not going to charge, try to get $100,000 for one song, but maybe $10 for another. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. The way that we, that we license is on it, on a, we call it a blanket license. So basically all of our licensees, the TV stations, the radio stations, the websites, pay us a fee, and in exchange for that fee, they can, pay, they can play as much BMI music from the entire catalog um, as they want to for the term of the contract. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's a fee for access to, to all of the works in the BMI repertoire. I see. And hopefully people listening see. We're listening to Richard Conlon describe BMI, Broadcast Music International, and it, what it does in the music business. And the licensing you're talking about for movies, just so people don't think the poor writer didn't make anything for getting a song in a movie, that's a different fee called the sync fee or synchronization fee where a movie company that wants to use What's Love All About in the movie called What's Love All About might pay as much as $200,000 to use that in the movie. That's where the guy will make some money up front. But the use of that movie later on as a broadcast will be tracked by BMI, and he'll collect the licenses he just spoke about. Well, in, in your opinion... Since there's so much talk about the state of the music business and CD sales are down, that doesn't really reflect on you, the sales, but do you feel like BMI is growing or the music business is? We, we are growing, and I, and I think what, what's happened is we've moved from a music marketplace. Let's think just about you know, feature music, like songs on the radio. We've moved from a marketplace where people want to own things and we're rapidly getting into a marketplace where people just want access to music. We've been very fortunate in that um, our revenue stream um, didn't suffer uh, the, way that, the way that some of the other entertainment companies did. And the reason for that is that we license so many different, um, different businesses, so we basically have a portfolio of licenses. The other thing that's happening when you look at the music business is that we're moving from a world where people might want to own things, whether it was records or tapes or CDs or even downloads, and we're moving into a world where people just want to hear things. They want to have them transmitted to them um, when they want them and where they want them. And for us and for, for BMI writers and for BMI publishers, this is a good development because that's exactly what we're selling. We're selling the right to, to access music, not the right to own it. Um, so for us, a lot of the technological change while it certainly it, it can be challenging, um, it represents um, a lot of great opportunity, and, and we're pretty excited about it. Tell me the BMI argument about the guy that says, I've, or, the, or the woman or man that says, my beauty shop, we're just playing the radio in our beauty shop. And it's, we, of course, it's an FM station that has all Barry Manilow and Barbara Streisand music, but why do we have to pay BMI a fee to do that? The radio station's broadcasting it. Don't they yeah. pay something? How do you argue that to where, as people may not know, that often a place where people are hearing music broadcast is required to have a license to be able to have it broadcast within their realm? Yeah, it's, and that, we, we have a whole division, our general licensing division, um, that, that works on that front. And um, that's, they, they basically listen to um, those and have those types, types of conversations all day. The, the answer is, is that the radio station um, is only paying for the right to um, transmit their signal. They're not paying for the right for the signal to be um, re received in, in, a, in, a, you know, in, in an establishment. Um, and then they're, so they're really not clearing those rights. Um, so 
when you're in a, a you know a, a, an establishment that's using music, first of all, the fee is is generally quite low. It's it's a dollar or something like that a day for a small business, mm-hmm. and uh, um, so I think that's that's helpful. I think that explaining um, to the licensee or the potential licensee um, that the intellectual property right hasn't been cleared there generally is very successful as well. And it's funny, there was an article in the New York Times last summer in the New York Times Magazine, and a reporter asked John that exact same question. And we sent the reporter out with one of our general licensing representatives, and he rode around in the car with this woman, and they <laughs> went to bars in Arizona. And he just, because he, he said the same thing, he goes, I'm just fascinated at how you can talk about an intellectual property license um, to someone who is running a bar or a restaurant or a retail store. He's like, how do you make that connection? And he was just intrigued by it. And, uh, and he did. He went, he went and he rode around for a week or so with, with one of our sales executives. And, um, and then he ended up writing this piece all about this sort of uh, journey through the desert. Um, and then at the, the end of the story was that the sort of the tough prospect in this article where they, the, the young woman who was working on this piece of business ended up saying, ah, you know what, I'm going to pay them. It's the right thing to do. So, um, you know, ultimately – um, you know, ultimately people do the right thing. Well, just so people understand that a little bit better, I like the analogy of going in there and saying, well, why do you play this beach music, beach boys, or whoever it is? Why do you play this music? Well, our beauty shop is called Earth Care for Your Hair, and we play a lot of acoustic John Denver kind of music and things like that. Well, does it help the atmosphere of your beauty shop? Well, of course, that's why we blah, 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 blah. Or yes, it does. Or, or people like jazz. Well, if it helps it, then it's helping you make money. And if you can't pay for that, then turn it off. Right. Well, that's, that, that becomes, <laughs> it's, it's funny when, when, when you say that, because really the story of the beginning of, of the whole concept of a, of a performing right and, and having, having um, you know, a, a right and a value go back to the composer happened in a restaurant and I believe it was in France and they said well you're playing my music and you're selling food and people are staying longer and um, you should be compensating me this is my work and then uh, and that that was sort of the the, the beginning um, well, of, of this whole idea yeah well it's understandable because often people just think of the number one songs or the big whatevers but a lot of these songwriters are not rich and they did this to make a living and they do it and they get a BMI check at the end of the year for some of that smaller airplay. And maybe this guy that is now 70 years old gets a royalty check for $5,000 from all that kinds of things. So his work was recognized and used and he got compensated. Otherwise, nothing. So right. You, and, and, you know, that, that's, it's, it's all about creating um, I mean, we, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're a service business, but we're also about creating an economy so that creative people can be paid and, and, and so that they can keep creating so that we can all enjoy this great music. And, 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 and you're right. Those, um, you know, BMI writers are not always riding around in limousines and they're not flying around in jets, that many of them are, are, are people who probably are working other jobs, but that this royalty is giving them just enough freedom to keep their creativity going. Well, um, Richard, I've sent many young writers to BMI, and I'm happy that they signed up. Like Chelsea Williams is a fantastic strong songwriter in Los Angeles, 22 years old, uh, among others. And I know why I did, but why would you tell somebody to come to BMI, or would you, as opposed to your other, the other competitor, you might say, which is ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, is the other music licensing entity in America of the same equal size of BMI. Why would you say, come here? I think that, that it, it's all going to be a choice. And I think the choice um, of choosing BMI uh, really boils down to service and it boils down to direction. So I think on, on the service front, um, we are really fortunate to have um, a, a creative team um, that really uh, spends time and gets to know our writers. And there still is a lot of physical time and physical touch and physical service um, taking place for a BMI writer, whether it's career development or um, helping in business matters and so forth. Um, there are real relationships there. 
Well, um, you said, and well, you, you said, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, and I think that the, the, the second part is, is that when you team that up with um, a company that has vision, we've always been um, ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about the future and running the business um, like a business, thinking about um, technological advancement, thinking about enhancing service. Um, we've always been uh, an innovator in terms of getting new revenue streams in for writers, in terms of bringing operating costs down. So I think when you combine sort of the, you know, the hard business fact of uh, money, service, technology, and someone who's really looking out for you, whether it's in Washington or in Brussels or um, anywhere around the world to make sure that your rights are protected. Well, I'll, with, I'll attest to that, Richard. I got a check last well, a few months back for, I don't know, $3,500 for stuff that was finally negotiated and settled for the years 2002 to 2005 in Europe. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Richard. <laughs> well, well, thank thank you. It's our it's 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 our it's our it's our pleasure to serve the writers. Well, you know, you say a very important word there with the word service, and people don't understand from the outside. They think a young writer. Well, why do I want to give my music to that company, or why do I want to turn my music? Well, you are a service for the writer. They are actually hiring you, in a sense, to be an agent that represents the rights of their music. Is that not correct? That is, that is absolutely true. I mean, when you, when you sort of do the elevator, what, what do you do? And I say, well, we, we represent um, songwriters and music publishers. Uh, we, are, we are their agents for this specific copyright. Um, and, um, and we are absolutely 100% a service business. Yeah, and, and writers and people need to understand that you are helping the whole thing continue is what I believe. <laughs> right, right. Whether, well, you know, whether it's um, getting deals for extremes or whether it's when there are public policy issues, when there are copyright issues in Europe or copyright issues here in America um, that could impact the value. It's, it's all about that, that service is tied to value, that we value creativity and we value our writers' rights so that we are, we're, we're always advocating for the right public policy to take care of our writers and publishers. And it's good for all. And it started quite a while back, just so our listeners were listening to Richard Conlon, who is a, a pretty big cheese at BMI, Broadcast Music International. How long has it been around? BMI uh, was founded in 1939, and we opened our doors in 1940. Couldn't find any doors for a while? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, it took, yeah, it took, it took a few months, I guess, to get the, get the paint to dry. Um, but yeah, we, we, we opened for business in New York City in, in 1940, so we're, we're pushing 75 years old. Wow. And were the early administrators or organizers, were they involved in the music business as writers themselves, like you know United Artists with Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks? Um, early on, BMI was founded by the broadcasting industry, oh. and so it's, it's actually a, a great story because... Um, at the time, there was only one rights organization in America, and um, they had proposed a um, significant rate increase for the radio industry, which was sort of the bulk of, of the business at that point. Mm -hmm. And the radio industry said, gosh, you know what? There's, I, I can only get rights to a, a, a pretty specific, discrete catalog to play, number one. And number two, and now they want to double or triple my fees. So the broadcasters created their own company and broadcast music inc was founded um amassed a repertoire um of music which wasn't being represented at the time so culturally um our company is often credited with really contributing to the explosion of country music and soul and r&b and jazz all of these forms of music that the society that was was there before us uh wasn't representing were represented by BMI and they found their way to the airwaves. And uh, so creatively, um, there, was, there was sort of a, a huge Big Bang theory when the company was formed that we played some role in unleashing new forms of American creativity in the music scene. Is the publisher Peer International a BMI company? Yes. I bring that up for a reason, because Peer has a lot of the music you just described, the other race music of the 20s, as they called it. And and eclectic music and bluegrass and gospel and things of that nature. Peer International has Foggy Mountain Breakdown. That's why I know about Peer, you know. No, so, that's, and Peer, Peer, Peer was there from the beginning with BMI, too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I tried to draw that out of you. 
<laughs> uh, let me say this about BMI, that although your competitor, which I hope you don't mind me mis- mentioning, uh, American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, its current president is Paul Williams, the guy that wrote We've Only Just Begun and a lot of other stuff. But BMI has songwriters up there, too. Dell, I mean, Dell Bryant is the president of BMI, and his father wrote Rocky Top and Kathy's Clown. Well, his father and his wife, Felix and Bulo Bryant, and uh, a bunch of the Everly Brothers hits. And Dell, I'm, does he write songs? Dell, Dell is, is, is a poet and a writer as well, and uh, he had a charting country song. And uh, Dell really grew up, um, as you mentioned, um, as a son of songwriters. So he, um, his heart um, and his life um, you know, certainly is that um, of a songwriter. So he brings that creative perspective to our management team. I bring this up because people that are looking at BMI, if you walk by the building in Nashville or New York, it's pretty imposing. I can't get in there. That's too big of a business. I'm not even sure what it does. And so they know that it's run by people that are writers, for writers. And where can people find out about that? Well, BMI.com is a really good start, and uh, there, there's a lot of information there. <laughs> so, and also, I've, I've got to say, we were for we, we had a meeting down in the Nashville office a few months ago mm-hmm. uh, with all of our employees, and uh, the opening comments were, um, it was a BMI town hall meeting, but we think of our Nashville office and our New York office as being a songwriter's town hall. So, mm-hmm. uh, and it might, the building might look big from the outside, but the door is always open. <laughs> and um, we, we believe that it's a place that, that it, it is a songwriter's home because that's, that's what we're all about. And you help that continue. Um, well, I'll tell you, I've really enjoyed talking with you, Richard, and I hope we can spread the word of BMI and get some young songwriters. Because I tell people, I mean, I've spent 45 years with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and we're still spending years uh, running into people on the road saying, well, I've got some songs. What should I do with them? I says, well, go find out about BMI, because if you don't, you're just, why, why bother? I mean, if you're selling cars, you, you have a car lot, <laughs> and you put signs up, and you expect to make some money from it. If this is your living, find out about it. At BMI.com, you can find out about it. What, is there any one thing you'd like to impart to listeners that are curious about the music business and BMI licensing, anything? Well, you know, I I I just think that uh, we we were we're thinking about another company that shares our initials. We were having a chat the other day about changes in the music business, and IBM turning 100 um, <laughs> kind of gave us a moment to think about BMI at 100 and about changing to meet the needs of markets and how sometimes when a thing seems like things are changing at an out of control rate, that really they're not. And that we're we're just really excited about watching BMI turn 75, and as markets change and creativity changes, the function of supporting writers doesn't change, and that's that's what we're committed to, um, supporting our writers and supporting our licensees. So um, we might look different, and you know, it might smell a little different, but it's going to be that that same function for for BMI at 100, just as it was um, and is for IBM. Well, traditionally, BMI is monitored music that's broadcast on TV, radio, or listened to in barbershops or uh, restaurants, but there's new places. What is it doing about websites? BMI has been working in in the digital sector for more than 15 years, and we did the first company to offer licensing for the Internet, and we did the first. It's a fast-growing business. We've made um, about $100 million dollars. Um, in the last 10 years in that business, and we believe we're going to make the next $100 million in three years. So uh, we have about 7,500 uh, licensees um, that, are, that are covered, digital properties that are covered by BMI licenses, um, and it's an area where we've, we've, we've aggressively gone after the market to, to service them. We've put together um, online licensing utilities, so you can actually go online and, and get your own license and um, pay your fees 24 hours a day. Um, you can get access to videos and tutorials on, on what we do and, and, and sort of help, you help yourself as a licensee navigate um, through um, all of the steps that you need to go to um, or go through in order to get a license. 
Um, so we, we're, we're very heavily involved. It's a business that uh, I actually was, was very fortunate to have begun here at BMI. So uh, wow. we, we, we've been at it for a long time. Well, how do you address the plethora of videos with music on YouTube and nobody's paying a licensing fee? I mean, to me, if it's a piece of my music and somebody's playing it on YouTube, I'm fine with it because it's great promotion and people will be led to buying it which will mean a mechanical fee on the publishing. But what do you think about that? Well, we actually um, have been working with YouTube um, since their early days, and we have uh, recently concluded a final license uh, with them. So YouTube is licensed by BMI, and wow. um, we, we work with them to identify um, feature uses of music and, and music uses all over the site, and we, we work with them every day to cover as much of the gazillions of plays of videos on YouTube that are out there and make sure that that money gets back um, to our writers and publishers. Now, in summation, BMI is a company that collects music money, money that music generates from being licensed and used by broadcasters and various people that we described. So you collect hundreds of millions of dollars. Is there and approximate or public percentage of that that you would say is operating expense and the rest goes to the writers, publishers? Yeah, we, we generally operate on, on somewhere in the 13%, 13 14%. So um, BMI operates um, on a nonprofit making basis. So out of every dollar that we collect, somewhere between um, you know, 86 and 87 cents goes right back to the writer and the publisher. Um, who either, you know, the person who either wrote that work or owns the copyright. That's incredible, because if you were the writer and goes, I don't want to do what, I don't want to sign up with BMI, I'll just do it myself. To collect that dollar would cost you about 5000 Right. <laughs> 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 well, that's even less than an agency commission or a manager commission, and that's quite commendable, I believe, and uh, as a very justifiable share of the pie. And... Uh, that's a good description. Okay, well, thank you, Richard Conlon. This is John McEwen talking with Richard Conlon at BMI, hearing what happens on the other side of that broadcast.